I have one of my all-time favorite people in this room with me right now. And it was interesting because I was telling him last evening, we had dinner together with a lot of other people. That sounded weird. Um, <laughs> and uh, uh, I was telling him that it was my children who actually started. You know how your kids will do that bring you. Our whole relationship is predicated pretty much on watch this, mom. And that's I realized that's how my conversations happen with my children. And, uh, and, and they would bring me these amazing videos to watch of this man of God, this man of integrity. And I just uh, really thought, wow, I'm so glad he's out there doing what he's doing. He's tearing it up. And that is none other than David Harris Jr. Glad to have you with us. David, um, you're on a panel this afternoon. Tell us about that. So we're here at the uh, Falkirk uh, Freedom Summit. I'm a fellow at Falkirk. And uh, this summit is about faith and liberty and exposing China and trying to bring an awareness to the American people of truly how big a threat China is. You know, they have a long game approach to trying to dominate us. And it's not just through uh, the modern warfare that we're used to as far as troops on the battlefield, but it's very strategic. And it's something that if we as Americans aren't paying attention to and aren't electing uh, uh, officials, politicians that are actually uh, aware of this and are gonna make some decisions uh, to help thwart that threat, then we could be in big trouble. So it's a good summit, great summit, great information, great people, great speakers like yourself. And yeah, yeah. Thank yeah, you. yeah, and um, so yours is on your your panel specifically is on religious liberty. It's more focused on religious liberties, yes. And and, and and so here's my question because I think a lot of folks, you know, when at first blush, the idea of religion um, seems to be a confining idea, not a liberty idea. Mm-hmm. Tell us. Well, the beautiful thing about our country is that uh, the defectors that started our country. They, they wanted to defect because they wanted religious liberties. They wanted to have the freedoms uh, to be able to worship and not have to worship or uh, uh, only yield to what the king, you know, what the king said that they had to uh, go along with. So the beautiful thing about our Constitution and our, and our Declaration of Independence is that it actually, uh, it's ingrained in there that our rights are from God. They're unalienable rights and the Constitution and our government is just supposed to protect those rights. So while you can say, well, religious liberties is okay, that's just one little box over here. Uh, the problem is freedom of speech, you know, our first, second amendment rights, freedom of arms. Uh, all of our rights are given to us uh, by God and our constitution acknowledges that. And there's a party right now and there's a movement right now that's trying to say, well, no, our rights come from, from the government. And if we're not careful and if we're not, if we're not paying attention, uh, we could elect somebody very easily that would say, you know what, government is uh, who gives you the power. Government is who gives you those rights. And that means that the government can then take those rights away. So religious liberties and the ability to uh, worship, uh, to sing, to gather, to get together, it's something that I think truly is is at the heart of a, a lot of Americans, millions, tens of millions of Americans in this country. And it's under attack right now more than ever. Uh, Gavin Newsom has, has issued the ban on getting together in church, no, no inside services. Uh, and so we see an awakening taking place. A good friend of mine, Sean Foyt, is a worship leader and he's been going up and down the beaches in California is about to get, head to Portland uh, and holding services on the beach and people are coming out and it's bringing unity and it's bringing an awakening I believe mm-hmm. a spiritual awakening that I really think that this country so desperately needs uh, just to how good God is. I've always loved church on the beach I think that's yeah. fantastic um, but you know we were going to get to winter where, where you know people in bad weather are not going to have those kinds of options and, and that's what I'm very concerned about especially because as the flu season comes back and yeah. you know uh, they decide to, to exert their power again um, one of the things you've done is you've been very very bold in um, just kind of walking into crowds whether it's an airplane or whether it's you know, this is one of the things you're known for is kind of sitting down on an airplane and taking your Trump hat and turning it around so that everyone on the back of the airplane behind you can see your Trump hat. But but taking bold uh, opportunities to make your statements, um, perhaps a little bit unexpected because uh, people don't expect you to be somebody that would support the president, especially in these times. Um, so so when you you know I like to give our audience takeaways. So when you talk to people about how you came to believe what you believe. What is your most potent argument? Well, I always try to find out where a person's at, you know, with their own moral compass. I think that the topic of of unborn babies, you know, that strikes at the core of who I am. Um, In my book, Why I Couldn't Stay Silent, uh, that you can get at my website, davidharrisjr.com. 
my wife actually wrote a chapter in there. I think it's the best chapter in the book. But she shared that. This is how he has a happy marriage. I'm just letting you know that. <laughs> she shared that, um, and I was there. Her mom was on, was on hospice and dying of cancer, and it was in our home. And my wife's aunt had come over and just kind of randomly threw out uh, in the kitchen to her sister, my wife's mom, man, Jeanette, aren't you glad you left that abortion clinic and had Jennifer? So my wife literally found out you know, in her mid-20s that her mom was about to abort her and decided at the last minute to leave. Her mom was a single parent. The, the father was not going to be in the picture. Um, she was poor. She didn't think she could raise a child, but yet she chose life. And now I'm uh, married for 26 years to my high school sweetheart. We have two amazing daughters. So the, the, the issue of life is, is deeply important to me, fighting for the lives of, of unborn babies. Um, and if that's often somebody's moral compass, then what else is, especially as far as people that we're going to elect to represent us. So when I'm talking to an individual, I like to find out where they're at there, and I'll hit them with some facts. You know, when Roe v. Wade was, was instituted, they thought it was a clump of cells. They didn't have the science that we have now. They didn't know that babies had their own fingers and tones and fingerprints and, its own, and their own DNA and, its, and their own heartbeat. And all those are signs of life and signs of an individual body. So that kind of throws the whole my body, my choice, you know, out the window. So I could be talking about that. Uh, if I'm talking to somebody in the black community, I, I run into individuals a lot of times while I'm traveling and wearing my Keep America Great hat or Make America Great hat that, uh, that I'll look for opportunities to just ask them how they feel about the president. And I've learned asking how they feel about the president is different than asking how they think sometimes. Interesting. Because people are emotional. So if you ask how somebody Absolutely. feels, it taps into the emotional side of you know, what they feel about, the, about an individual or the president. What do you think about his policies? And they don't seem to have as much to say because they don't really know. Uh, especially in the black community, they're not hearing the facts of what this president's done. Historic record funding for historical black colleges and universities gave more in his first year in office than Obama did all eight years, in any of the eight years that Obama was in office. And then he increased it the second year, and then he made it permanent funding the third year with even more. Uh, so if he didn't like the black community or if he was racist, like the mainstream media tries to say, why would he even care about doing something? Zones. Oh, then yes. it's opportunity zones and it's lowest historic, lowest uh, unemployment for the black community, highest uh, employment for the black community. Uh, the list goes on and on, but uh, prison reform. Uh, so I just try to hit him with some facts and give him a, enough seeds to and encourage them to go research it for themselves. And I've actually had some people come back and, and message me and say, you know what, I didn't know the facts that you shared. I'm glad you shared those with me. So that's all we can do. You know, I, I don't think we can win somebody over necessarily the first time we talk to them, but we can plant seeds or water seeds somebody else has sown and then pray that God will bring the increase. All right. Yeah. David Harris, Jr., thank you so much for being with Absolutely. us. Absolutely. All right. Thank you.